I'm Sean from Offload Rugby Media. I'm Simeon from the TikTok Ref. Guys, I'm Murray, also known as Boss for Rugby HQ. And you're listening to the Rugby Connection Podcast. For the fans, by fans. Okay, Murray, <coughs> do you want to get us kicked off? Yeah, so thank you for coming on the show. I know we I messaged you about coming on and congratulations, you are officially the first guest on the Rugby Connection Podcast. Thank you for having me on, I really appreciate it. You're very welcome. So obviously you do TikTok like the rest of us. How do you think that's changed like your life so far? It's mad. Like I, yeah, it's like, you know, I started making TikToks just for a bit of laugh. I have my own little humour. I think I'm like, my brain thinks I'm really funny. Other people, my rugby team think really otherwise. <laughs> but I think I'm really funny. So I was like, oh, this, this seems like a funny thing. If I do like a rugby version of the TikTok trends, that seems really fun. Um, it started as a boredom thing in lockdown one. And then I started to realise that actually there were not enough people, particularly representing women in rugby. And so actually then I started to kind of up my content a little bit. I was, I'm lucky now to have nearly 10,000 people, um, you know, that are following my content, that's sharing my content, um, and so I then started to realise the power that we have to actually be able to engage, particularly like um, younger women into rugby. Yeah, that's, that's great. I have seen that you have been like pushing for like equality and all that. And obviously you are a big rugby fan and I believe you are an Exeter Chiefs fan, just like me and Simeon. Yeah. Yes, I am. I'm, I'm lucky enough to live on the outskirts of Exeter. Um, my home club is Topsham, which is just down the road. So um, Sam Skimmon. The set the Sam Skinner is one of ours, um, and we're lucky to have great involvement um, from the Chiefs at our club and in the local community. So, yeah, big Chiefs fan, and the, the Chiefs women like I've been so proud of them as, as a team. They've become really cohesive this season, um, and the captain Linda Van der Velden, she's just lovely. Like I've had a really lovely time chatting to her. Um, she's great as well. Such a great representation representative of the Chiefs. Yeah, that's good. That kind of falls onto my next question, just because obviously you have been watching like the women's premiership. We did have the final with Saracens against Harlequins. How did yeah. you think of it? Obviously, as like a neutral game, how do you think it was? I mean, it's so much. You know, every game, every final is a nail biter, and you've got two such immensely strong teams. You know, you've basically got half the England women's squad versus half the, the other half of the England women's squad. So you know that it, it's always going to be a brilliant head to head. Um, and, you know, it's it's all the players that I love and admire coming together. Um, and oh, I don't know how to say it without sounding like an absolute nause, but like it's one of those games, score aside, it showcases what we can do, you know, and it, show, it really just showcases the talent and the skill of women's rugby. And so, you know, as much as it was a brilliant game, score aside, it showcases the cream of the crop of what we've got. I mean, I think the whole premiership has this season. Yeah, that's fair. I, I agree with that. Um, from what I've seen, and I've obviously, because I'm a Chiefs fan, I have been following the women's team. And obviously for their first season, I think they did all right. But yeah, I think, yeah, can't really complain much about how they performed overall. Yeah, I, I, you know, obviously they had a lot of people come from quite a few different nations um, and different skill sets coming in. So it took, you know, it takes that time for that team to become cohesive. But you could see that when, when they were starting to get, you know, the game plan together and get to know, you know, whose talents really lay where, where you know, you had like, you've got Van der Velden dotting down tries all day. You've got, you know, um, people like Merrin Deutsch coming, flying in from fullback to come and, and support. And it's been really great to see. I love seeing those local players like Merrin and Kaylee Armstrong, for example, getting the runouts alongside the talented international players, because I think that that's really important for our local community as well and to encourage the girls locally. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. Well, thank, thank you for that. Thank you for that, Gemma. That's okay. <laughs> Um, so thank you again for coming on. It's brilliant to have you as our first de guest. Um, more of a different, more not negative, but I like your opinion on this from your perspective. Where do you feel the biggest inequalities are from the men's and the women's game? So I really think it's it, it's it's kind of a cycle: lack of funding and lack of promotion. 
there's two aspects of it. And I made I made a TikTok a little while ago, actually, about the gender gap in rugby. And I had to remove it. And it's yeah. I got abuse for three whole weeks. I, I had, I, I think it was like something over 250 hate comments. I had my first ever death threat. I mean, it was from some from little cocky 14 year old. His mum was going to drive him down to come and bang me out or something. Um, but, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it, but like I, I, the abuse I got. And what was really interesting was that I, I researched everything that I put into that TikTok. I mentioned about the actual pay gaps, how, for example, um, in, in the premiership, for example, the men's players often earn around 24K a game. The women earn that in a year which is just a staggering difference, a staggering difference. But to me, it's it's the little things. And for example, the BBC saying, yes, we've got, you know, the women's six nations, we've got the final, but then putting it in the back of, BT, of, of BBC Sport, where you had to dig for it and putting things like flogging it above the women's six nations, those things are not helpful for promotion. Things like how the men's premiership is, you've gone to BT Sport and it's there. The women's, you often have to dig through the back end of YouTube. And so we can't get more funding without more promotion. But you've got to fund the promotion in the first place. And I think that that little cycle is a really vicious cycle that we are really stuck in for the women's game at the moment. It's being broken by people like Ugo Monier. You know, Ugo is taking such a great stand for women in rugby at the moment. I'm so proud to have such an eloquent, articulate and intelligent ambassador. And... This is where I think our male advocates actually place, can play such an important role, both within clubs, um, online, it, just everywhere. That's not only our female advocates, but our male advocates have a really important voice in helping that kind of helping us get that little step up that we need. No, I, I, I know I completely agree with everything you said. That I mean, I've tried to help as much as I can with women's rugby in Wales, and it's obviously in quite a dark place at the moment. But that's because in Wales, our regional teams are it's awfully funded. It's not well funded at all. And you obviously get the good players go over to England and get to play in the best yeah. possible league. And then the other players get completely left behind. So you've got a massive difference in that. But yeah. yeah. Um, and my other little question to you is how do you respond well? Or how do you respond to people, like you said, who are just twits and just rude about women's rugby? Because I, I mean, I firmly believe more funding in women's, you get a higher skill level, you get better tackling, and it will go as good as the men's. Because you've got more funding. That's how I think it When you bring in women, you build rugby clubs. Because what you do is you bring in mums who then have kids, who then go to the cults. You bring in women to um, boost the club. You bring in women who bring their sisters. You bring in so much. When you bring in women to a rugby club, and even the women that aren't mums, sisters and everything, you bring people with talents and skill sets that you never would have had if the women's team weren't there. And so... And what people don't realise is that as you promote women's rugby at a local level, so if you say to your mate, hey, come try my local club, what you are building is a step up the ladder. So if we have more people at the local clubs, we've got more talent at county level. If we've got more talent at county level, that's more Poppy Cleals, that's more, um, you know, Shauna Brown, that's more of those people coming through at international level. So it really does start at the local clubs. And that's why I'm very passionate um, I went down and coached some of the um, under 14s in Exmouth about a year and a half ago. And I'm passionate about reaching those kind of younger ages. All of my friends pretty much know I'm like, come on, come try training, come try training. And so that's what we need to be doing, I think, to build the sport at every level. Get women and girls to just have a go at their local. I completely agree. It's a promotion pyramid, isn't it? You start bigger base, you get bigger top. Absolutely. All day. Um, Gemma, I was just going to ask you, I know in my own club, a lot of the focus from the executive level and the board level is on the men's for first 15 sides um, and not much attention is given to much else yeah. apart from that. Do you think that women's rugby deserves or should get more support from like the men's side of the game or just clubs as a whole putting more focus in on the women's side of the game? Yeah, I, it, you know, we don't, if you had had two teams turn up to play rugby and one of them was really well equipped they had the best boots they had you know a couple of almost premiership standard players and then you had another you had another the other team that's turned up they've got no boots they don't really have coaches 
Um, you, you're not on an equal playing field. And that's what's happening when you've got a men's team that's really well equipped and that's really well promoted. And then you've got a women's team at the same club that is not having the same, you know, we're not asking to be better. We're not asking to be promoted above men. We're just being asked to be put on the same playing field, which I think everyone in rugby can really relate to. You know, we all want to be on the, the same playing field. So, you know, it, there's amazing ways that the men's team can support the women's team. And it doesn't have to cost a penny or do a single thing. It's the little things like coming and buying a pint when our games are on. Our games are, you know, so for example, I know in most clubs that in Devon, the women's games are on a Sunday, the men's are on a Saturday. So I go and watch the men's team go buy a pint. And I'm always really chuffed when they come down and, and do the same. It's a little thing, but numbers on the sidelines, it's more people seeing us. It's, it feeds into that pyramid. And that is one of the ways that the men's team can support. Sharing our Facebook posts, it's the really the little things that just keep building us. Um, and it's, it's just being aware of like the things that are very, that are not necessarily meant badly, but come across badly. So for example, I have, I've been at a club where we were booted off the main pitch, basically. We were, the ladies were already training and we were booted off the main pitch so that the men's first team could train. It, it doesn't, it's not hard to split the pitch. It's not hard to just say, oh, we'll come back later. But it's, it's yeah. the way that that looks is just really poor, really, really poor. Yeah, no, that's uh, not a good way to go about it on the club's behalf. But um, I'm just going to take it back a step. And how and when did you first start playing or get involved in rugby? So I come from a completely non-rugby family. Um, I'm the first person in my family at all to show any interest. Um, I knew my coach, I kind of had started to get involved on the bar at my, my local group, rugby club, but I didn't really know about like women playing or anything like that. And I kind of, I knew my first coach really well. And he kept saying to me every time I saw him for about six months, come down and try it, you'll love it. Come down. And I, after six months of come down and try it, you'll love it. I went, you know what? I'm going to humour you. I'll come down for one session. I will probably be absolutely shocking, but I'm going to humour you. And I came down and we were doing pad work and I'll never forget it because I'm quite big by that team standards. Um, I'm five, five, nine and a half ish. Um, and I was about 95 odd kilograms at that point. So I was quite bulky. And I just ran through everyone with the pads. It was, I had a cracking time. And I was like, oh, this is a bit fun. <laughs> and that's when I kind of fell in love with it. And I, I was, so that was down at Withicombe. I was very blessed um, when I moved up towards London to play for Windsor RFC as well. And now I'm back in Devon and yeah, playing for Topsham. And, you know, I've been, I've been so lucky at all three clubs. I've met some amazing people. I met, had some amazing experiences. Um, when I was at Windsor, we won like a plate final and I got to have a medal and it was such crazy, like amazing experiences that have built my passion for the game. Yeah. Um, yeah. And just one thing I was just going to ask you, what's your favourite part about rugby? Is it something off the field or is it something on the pitch? Oh, that's the one. Everyone always asks me this and I never, I can never pinpoint it. I mean, there's so much that I love about it. It's, I think the main thing is the fact that, especially in the women's game, this, it does not matter if you are five foot and seven stone or six foot two and 18 stone or whatever, there's a place for you. And as someone who always grew up a little bit taller, a little bit broader than the rest, who really hated that and was never taught to love that. And then I turned to rugby and they kind of went, no, no, that's a superpower. That's something really useful. And that totally changed my whole mindset about my body about how I felt and I see the power of that in other women too other women who have maybe taller broader you know or even just shorter you know who maybe just didn't fit in with a certain norm they can come to rugby and there's a place for them every, all day every day I love that and I love I love having a few beers after the game as well always I'm very much a social <laughs> member <laughs> I will always be a social member that's brilliant I'll hand it back to Murray I think Murray might have a few more questions um, yeah, I was just going to say, um, so for you personally, like, where do you want to go in your rugby career? Do you, or do you just want to like, stay here or do you want to like, aim? Are you aiming for like to be a premiership player and then an England player and so on and so forth? Sure. I, I know my limits. I, I know that I am not a premiership standard player. 
I maybe like to get a Devon County run out if I'm lucky one day. But my, I, you know, I've had a bit of a journey. I've had a couple of big injuries, unfortunately, um, and a few bits and bobs. And so I'm I'm not going to be Premiership. I'm probably not going to. I may get County run out if I'm lucky. I want to be good at what I do. I want to be good at my own position. And I also, I think that that is what makes me, can make me relatable for people, especially when they're first coming to the sport, is the fact that I'm the kind of person you'd meet at a normal rugby club. You know, you turn up to the rugby club and I'm that one who's going, hey, welcome to the club, come see me, you know, come hang out with me kind of thing. And I think that that, I love having that. and I love having that for new people. And I'm hoping that that's what comes across online as well. Um, so that's kind of my ambition, really. I, I've lost about four and a half stone in the last year. So unfortunately, I may have to rebrand from the prop life because I'm a little bit small to prop now. Um, <laughs> but I'm hoping to have a, a few run outs in the age shirt this season. So that's my main goal is to get a couple of run outs at eight because I, I really like that's my, that's my little personal goal. But yeah, that's about it. <laughs> that's great. And well done for the weight loss. Thank you. It's been hard work, um, I tell you. Uh, it's, it's, it's all worth it we're all I'm trying to like cut weight or make weight or whatever all the time and it's it's frustrating but it, it's all worth it um it I've got an, I've got a little fun one for you so what I've been doing yep. recently on my on my TikToks is I get asked to do like like a starting 15 of like x y and z and so on and so forth and I remember you like uh, really pushing for like a British and Irish lioness squad I'll call it that yes um, now this so, is I'm, oh, this is where I may completely fail because I see so many of the women's international players and I'm like, you are brilliant. You are so good. But I am absolutely shocking with names and especially off the top of my head. I, I really do want a British and Irish lionesses, but I also think at the moment we're not ready for it. So from the international scenes, obviously England's one of the only professional women's teams in the internationals. So unfortunately, my British lion, my British and Irish lionesses would be largely England players, which I don't think does justice to the Irish, Scottish, Welsh players that would be just as good if they had that those pro contracts. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, I think I'm, and it's not, it's nothing against like the women because I, I think I've said it to you that I was quite new to the whole women's side of rugby this year because of the Six Nations. Yeah. And I think I could, I think I could only name like three Scotland players and that's only because like one's the captain so she's on all the posters yeah one scores a lot of tries and then one funnily enough followed me on Instagram I don't know why but yeah she did so yeah. like, I only I only know Helen Nelson Rona Lloyd and uh, Lisa Thompson and I know yeah. they're all in like the GB7 circuit as well so but yeah and I know that like obviously like Helen Scarrett and all that from yeah, England. so I'm, I'm definitely way, you know, I could give you an England Dream 15 all day because I'm very, very familiar with them. I'm shocking with some of the other names. But I'm, I'm again, I'm making an effort to know people and getting making an effort to get to know people. Um, and you've got like, you've got some insane players coming through. And that is what is so exciting about the women's game at the moment is there are just so many exciting players. Like, Every lineup that I saw, even the games that were losses, there was someone that I was like, oh, you are really talented. You are really talented. I think for Wales, you've got Jasmine Joyce, who I think could make a Lions. Yeah. Always, I've always, I remember watching her back in yeah. the Olympics last time. That's the first time I saw her. And she was the only Welsh. I think she was the only non-English player in that team. And it was like, every time she got yeah. the ball, go and she kind of become, in the women's, very much a cult hero now in Wales. She's honestly Jasmine Joyce. That she runs the speed that my brain thinks I run at. Um, <laughs> she's outrageously talented, and she, yeah, she's got a very, very bright future. That one, very, very bright future. You know, e even just looking from an England perspective, the team that is coming together is just so cohesive, and you've got a. You, both team, you know, you, you were seeing, especially in the in the Six Nations, like you were seeing those talented structures come together. And I think that that's something in the women's game particularly that's highlighted is those talented structures. Um, and, but you were also getting individuals that like Jess Breach, 
you know, look at Jess Breach's first season at Harlequins. She was dotting down tries like it was, you know, no one's business. <laughs> and she's done the same at England. Her debut, she scored like four tries. It was ridiculous. And so you've got stars like that come through in the backs. Obviously, as a forward, I, you know, always I'm standing the forwards all day, every day. Um, and we've got some incredible talent there through coming there as well. Um, you know, uh, you've got the Cleals all day. I've always named up them, Shorter Brown. Um, you've got people like Miller Mills, who I'm always excited to see in second row. Like her and Kath O'Donnell. Ridiculous second row. Ridiculous second row. <laughs> Um, one more question, Gemma, just because like the BBC and ITV obviously split the Six Nations now, yeah. um, and the, the BBC have reached an agreement to do the women's Six Nations like unprecedented footage for next year. But as yeah. you said, like it was so hard to find it this year. So what would you think is unprecedented for next year? I just think, I think the BBC has got to stand by what they're saying. So I think. That they, you know, that's great that you're doing the Six Nations. Stand by that. Make it a headline. You know, it should be an honour to have an international tournament on your on your show. It should be an absolute honour to have an in, international show on your um, on your network. And that's um, that's something I think that needs to be really put across. So I, I really hope that they put it more in the forefront. Um, I hope that they really they promote it, you know they should because what this does again that it gets those girls who look like the women that they're seeing. Um, you know my quote from I did an interview with O2 a little while ago, and the quote from that which has gone crazy was in a world of Kardashians we meet more Shauna Browns, and I totally stand by that because. In a world where young girls are being influenced by celebrities that are, you know, plastic, so, so fake, we need more real people that are strong, that are strong build. If I'd have known more about influences like that when I was younger, I would have joined rugby way earlier. I would have had such a different outlook on my body, on myself. So I think they need to just, I think what BBC and ITV need to do is really understand what they're taking on and really promote it accordingly. Yeah, no, I totally agree with that. Couldn't have, like, you've basically ripped half the words out of my mouth there. So I just, I think that the bit that, it, like I said, was the unprecedented. I'm like, well, you've hardly done anything with it, with what you've got. So I don't know what you're classing as unprecedented. Like, oh, we've moved on to BBC iPlayer or a song like, do you know what yeah. I mean? Like, is, that, is that what they class as un- unprecedented? Because that's not to me. Yeah. One president to me would be like, like the likes of like what BT Sport or Channel Four does. Like, you like rugby, you like women's rugby. Here's an advert. There you go. It's on at this time. Like, it's something exactly. simple like that. And it only needs to be like you know, in the half time of the men's Premiership games, show a thirty second clip, a highlight reel of the women's Prem. Here's where you can watch it. That instantly boosts it up. But to me as well, again, to put us on a level playing field, the women's Premiership, in my opinion, should be on BT Sport. Because if yeah. you're going to have the men's on there, you should have the women's on there as well. Um, that's just my opinion, Mick. But I, that's what I feel should be should be happening. So I really hope that, as I said, that they re- realise what an opportunity they have and that they really promote it accordingly. They put it on the prime spots, the prime channels. Um, so that, yeah, the kind of the girls that like me can see it and can be inspired by it. Yeah, definitely. Well said, Gemma. Couldn't have said it like any better myself. Um, just one more thing that I could think of. World Rugby announced like a big, massive women's tournament. I think it's next year now, just because of the pandemic. Yeah. Just what do you think that's going to skyrocket women's rugby? Or weirdly, I think COVID has done so much good for the women's game. Um, obviously, it was meant to be on the same time as the men's Six Nations and was delayed due to COVID. Um. And actually that did us so much of a favour because it gave us more attention on the game. And especially having that during kind of mid-lockdown period, people had nothing else to do but watch it. It gave us so much more, um, yeah, much more of a launch pad to be seen. And I really, really hope that that's what that, what happens next year. 
Um, and like, for example, the, the Olympics and everything like that. You know, we've got an upward trajectory here. I know I'm going to be promoting the, the Jesus out of it. Um, and I really hope that other people do. And that's where, as I've said before, like not just our female advocates, but our male advocates are really, really important in helping get that message out. I think between yeah. the two of us, we can all say we will be massively promoting and do plan for the women's game as well. Definitely, definitely. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think I've tried, like, I did kind of cover like the women's Six Nations and I did kind of be a bit vague about it, like, look, here's a result, this yeah. happened. I, like, I, was kinda, like, I don't really know a whole lot, I can't tell if they're good players or bad, etc. But like, I did like congratulate England women for winning the Six Nations title like three years in a row. French yeah. women, French women did well, like so on and so forth. So yeah, as soon as I was like the women, French team uh, are insane. Like they are so so talented. It's ridiculous. Yeah, I can't argue with it's that. It's crazy. My friend actually, she's playing in like the equivalent of the French Premiership at the moment. Yeah, she. Right. she my friend's playing out in the um, French Premiership, and she just some of the players she plays with. I mean, wow the absolute talent she live streams her games and again i try and watch them and like i was saying earlier it's the little ways that our males male advocates can help support us streaming a game mentioning it to your mates a lot of for example male to male engagement is more successful for the women's game than female to male engagement in some instances for example just chats at the clubhouse like oh you're watching the ladies game stuff like that it that's what helps it just those little actions are really, really powerful. Yeah, that, I, think that's, I don't think that's much to ask. I think that's quite a fair... Completely. Like, yeah. I mean, I'll, I'll, like Simeon said, we'll definitely yeah. be um, like sharing about women's rugby and trying to get the word out as best we can. And obviously, Thank just... you. I know as... referee terms, Holly Davidson's been given a men's international sevens game. The Scottish women's referee, she's leaps and bounds i mean she's doing pro 14 and everything so it's great from referees perspective we're getting yeah. I mean, like the union we're really pushing for women's referees so every time i speak to someone who's injured or something i'm like go and do refereeing i'll get you on the course i know where yeah. the course are. i know the people get on the course go and do some refereeing it's great and I, it's yeah and you've got you've got people like sarah cox as well who i mean i just love coxie she's absolutely class but she i'd really recommend if you can chat to her at some point do she is someone who is so, she's got such an aura around her, such a presence. Like she, you can see that she could be put in a room full of, full of men and just not an eyelid is batted. And she, that's where she, and again, in her own way is doing leaps and bounds for the women's game, just by showing up, being there and doing what she does at such a talented level. Um, yeah, and that's where as well women, we can keep promoting our own game. So if you do have an injury or if you do retire or if you just decide, you know, play is not for you anymore, that's fine. Young girls need to be inspired by females, refing, coaching, being involved, just being at the clubhouse. Um, that's where I think I see a lot of the drop off from kind of early teen into seniors, because at, especially at small clubs, if women aren't involved, girls just don't see that it's there. It's just not, again, it's not a visual thing. And I think that that's where, you know, I've, I've some people have asked me to do a few talks at their club and I'd be more than happy to talk to any, you know, youngsters that are like looking at rugby um, because if it keeps, if it keeps them coming through the system and if it keeps people going, that's absolutely what we as women in the game should be doing. Absolutely spot on. I couldn't agree more. You, you're definitely a role model in an aspect and because you're on TikTok and it's such a big like social media like phenomenon now it's obviously changed like all four of us somewhere or another so like obviously yeah. like, all girls um, like girls like starting like high school will be like well, watching you and like, oh she's pretty cool I want to be like her thank you that's I when I make my TikToks that's who I make it for like I make it for again I, I think what would what would 16 15 year old me want to see you know what would what would 16 year old me want to hear or need to hear and that is who is at the core of what I do um, you know yeah because as, as I said before like my experience through life would have been a lot different had I found rugby earlier um, 
So that's what I want to get across and get people coming through the doors younger, um, knowing that, that, especially during that kind of awkward teenager phase when people are growing different shapes, all the rest of it, you're normal, you're fine. Um, if, if just one person had turned around to me age 15 and 16 and gone, you're not fat, you are so strong. You have shoulders the width of a barn door and, and had taken me into a front row, it would have genuinely changed my life. And so that's what I want my 15 year old, 16 year old self to see. Emma, that's, yeah, that's, um, that's brilliant. Uh, we're actually just coming up on the time that we have left in our free Zoom plan. But um, uh-huh. we'd, like to, we'd like to very much thank you for coming on, for Thank you. fitting for our first episode. Thanks a million, Gemma. Thank, thank you so much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. No oh, problem, so you're, well, you're welcome anytime. Anytime, anytime. you'd like to come.